Once upon a time, in the medieval world, there existed a unique and devout group of Christian women who dedicated their lives to simplicity, chastity, and the pursuit of knowledge in the name of God. This tale takes us back to the 4th century CE, a time when these women, much like their male counterparts in remote parts of Egypt and Syria, led ascetic lives. Among the notable figures of this period was Saint Mary of Egypt, a reformed prostitute who spent 17 years in the desert in pursuit of a devout life. As time unfolded, these ascetics started coming together in communities, initially maintaining individualistic lives, but eventually joining forces for communal services. These communities evolved into what we now recognize as monasteries and nunneries. The concept of monastic life journeyed to Europe in the 5th century CE, with figures like Saint Benedict of Nursia laying down rules for monasterial conduct. Legend has it that Saint Benedict's twin sister, Saint Scholastica, founded nunneries for women. These sacred spaces, often situated at a distance from monks' monasteries, aimed to prevent any distractions from the opposite sex. In the 13th century CE, a new branch of ascetic life emerged. Male friars, rejecting material possessions, lived as individuals relying on the generosity of well-wishers. Saint Francis of Assisi pioneered this mendicant lifestyle, inspiring orders like the Franciscans and Dominicans. Women, too, embraced this calling, with Claire of Assisi establishing all female mendicant communities known as convents. However, the church imposed restrictions on women's preaching outside their communities. Despite the challenges, by 1263 CE, the Order of St. Clair gained official recognition with the stipulation that the nuns remain within their convents, adhering to the Benedictine Order's rules. Thus, the medieval monastic life, whether for men or women, unfolded as a shared journey shaped by common texts, practices, and the support of wealthy benefactors. Also in, in the world of medieval nunneries, the architectural design mirrored that of their male counterparts. The central hub of these complexes, much like in monasteries, was the cloister, encircling an open space and connecting various vital structures such as the church, the communal refectory, kitchens, accommodation, and study areas. Some nunneries even housed quarters for pilgrims who sought the holy relics safeguarded by the devoted nuns, relics ranging from a slipper of the Virgin Mary to a skeletal finger of a saint. Graveyards within the grounds were segregated, with one designated for nuns and another for laypeople who paid for the privilege of resting eternally in the company of the devoted sisters. Recruitment into these sacred spaces was a multifaceted affair. While the primary motivation for women to join a nunnery was piety and the pursuit of a life closely tied to God, practical considerations, especially for aristocratic women, played a significant role. For many from the aristocracy, two main life paths lay ahead, marriage to a supportive husband or entry into a nunnery. Consequently, nunneries flourished with recruits, especially from aristocratic circles, surpassing even the numbers of male monasteries by the 12th century CE. Young girls, often sent by their parents, found in nunneries an opportunity for education, the best available to medieval girls, or a practical solution for families with numerous daughters. These young girls, known as oblates, could transition into becoming novice nuns in their mid-teens, taking vows after a year or so of training. Novices came from diverse backgrounds, including older individuals seeking a contemplative retirement or those preparing for the afterlife. The rules and daily life within nunneries were typically guided by the regulations of the Benedictine order, with some adopting the more austere practices of the Cistercians from the 12th century CE. The abbess, often a widow with prior estate management experience, held absolute authority over the nuns. Assisting her were a prioress and senior nuns with designated duties. Unlike monks, nuns were unable to become priests, necessitating regular visits from male priests for religious services. In the early medieval period, the requirement of virginity was integral, seen as the starting point for achieving spiritual purity. However, by the 7th century CE, the understanding evolved, recognizing that married women and widows could contribute significantly to monastic life, emphasizing the importance of spiritual fortitude in the ascetic journey of vowed women. Also, in the quiet confines of nunneries, where simplicity and devotion intertwined, the life of a nun unfolded in accordance with strict rules and routines. Clad in a simple, long tunic, the nun symbolically renounced worldly possessions and distractions. A veil adorned her, covering all but her face, signifying her role as a bride of Christ, with her hair kept short beneath the concealing fabric. Isolation was a key tenet of a nun's existence. Forbidden from leaving the nunnery, 
encounters with outside visitors, especially men, were minimized to the utmost extent. Yet, tales of scandal occasionally punctuated the serene atmosphere. In the mid-12th century CE, Watton Abbey in England witnessed a scandalous affair between a lay brother and a nun. Discovered and deemed sinful, the lay brother faced the harsh punishment of castration, a common sentence during that period for such transgressions, even if the relationship appeared consensual. The daily routine of a nun mirrored that of a monk, punctuated by various services and prayers offered for the well-being of those beyond the convent walls, particularly the souls of donors to the nunnery. The power of a nun's prayer was deemed just as potent in safeguarding one's soul as that of a monk. Engaging in intellectual pursuits, nuns spent considerable time reading, writing, and illustrating. Nunneries became repositories of knowledge, with manuscripts circulating not only within the walls, but also extending to priests, monks, and even laypeople in the local community. Among the notable contributors to this literary treasure trove was the German Benedictine abbess Hildegard of Bingen. Distinguishing themselves from monks, nuns engaged in needlework, embroidering robes and textiles for use in church services. This artistry was no mere pastime, as some medieval nuns achieved sainthood for their skill with a needle. Beyond the walls, nuns embraced charitable work, distributing clothes and food to the poor daily, and increasing their generosity on special anniversaries. Laycock Abbey in Wiltshire, England, founded in 1232 CE by Ella, Countess of Salisbury, exemplified this tradition by providing bread and herrings to a hundred peasants on each anniversary of the founder's death. Nuns, extending their nurturing hands, assumed roles as tutors, caretakers of the sick, supporters of distressed women, and providers of hospice services for the dying. Unlike male monasteries, nunneries were intimately connected to their local communities, often situated within urban settings rather than remote locales. As a result, nuns became more visible to the secular world, leaving an indelible mark on the fabric of medieval society. As the centuries passed, these sacred spaces continued to evolve, leaving an enduring legacy that transcended the confines of their cloistered walls. The 15th century brought winds of change to the medieval world, and the nunneries too experienced a transformation. The restrictions that once bound nuns within the walls of their convents began to loosen. Recognizing the immense contributions of these devoted women to knowledge, art, and charitable endeavors, the church gradually granted them the opportunity to step beyond the threshold of their sanctuary. One such transformative figure emerged in the form of Sister Agnes of Avignon, a visionary nun whose unwavering dedication to education and charitable works garnered widespread admiration. Inspired by the humanist movement that swept through Europe, Sister Agnes envisioned a world where nuns could freely engage with the secular society without compromising their devotion to God. In 1475, at a gathering of ecclesiastical authorities, Sister Agnes passionately pleaded for a reconsideration of the restrictions imposed on nuns. Her eloquence and the testimonials of the communities they served moved the hearts of those present. The church, acknowledging the changing times and the invaluable role of nuns in the broader community, officially lifted the restrictions that confined them to the convents. With this newfound freedom, nunneries became vibrant centers of learning, art, and benevolence. Nuns emerged as educators, not only for their own sisters, but for the children of the towns and villages surrounding their sanctuaries. They opened schools, where both boys and girls received instruction, fostering an environment of intellectual curiosity and enlightenment. As the medieval world transitioned into the Renaissance, the story of the nunneries took an unexpected turn. The once restricted nuns found themselves not only embracing the world beyond their cloisters, but actively shaping it.